You know, every time I do a video like this, I get a lot of flack from certain people that say stuff like, you know, who really cares if a band doesn't cover all these details in these overplayed songs? As long as the crowd's happy and the bar owner's happy, what difference does it really make? Well, what's crazy is not too long ago, we played a show with an ACDC tribute band called Back in Black. And they've been around a long time, and they were awesome to watch live, and they're really cool guys as well. What I remember most, though, is realizing all the little details that they were hitting in these songs that a lot of cover bands, including bands that I've been in, uh, just neglected altogether. And I thought, wouldn't that be great if more cover bands could add a little bit of that tribute band attention to detail into their songs? I mean, I know cover bands have a lot on their plate. They have to play 50 to 60 songs sometimes, for all from different artists, and it could be very daunting to try to get really deep with them. But I thought if somebody just takes a couple of the details I show today and slip them in the song, how much of a big difference that can make. One time somebody said that they played the right bass line finally for a particular song and he looks over and the drummer was just smiling. And I thought, see, that's the kind of thing I'm going for with this series. I've probably heard a hundred bands play this song over all the years that I've been playing live. So I'm gonna use all of that information to share with you the details that I find are usually missed. The first thing is what I always say, a lot of bands use too much distortion. And you could tell right away with the intro if that's the case. So here's what I hear a lot. It's just like too much, you know what I mean? So I'm going to go back off my gain like I should have. Back when my teenage metal band played this as kind of a filler tune, my tone was horrendous. Check it out while I go fix my amp. Okay, I just brought the gain down from 10 to about 3. You can always dial back the volume to cut out some of the gain too. So now we have this. Way more pleasing to the ear while having a better, fuller tone. Because sometimes when you add too much gain, it just dissolves your tone. And you have to forgive that footage I just showed you because we were like 14 or something like that. And I think I was using a heavy metal pedal or something. Now, speaking of the intro, that's the next thing I'm going to talk about is a lot of people play it in the wrong position. <laughs> I blame this on Bad Tab. When I first started, I think it was a magazine or a certain book. I actually have an ACDC tab book that has it wrong. They have us playing it back here. And I see tons of people doing it. Look it up on YouTube. You see a lot of cover bands play it down here. <laughs> Something like that. That's how I used to play it. This whole, it's so weak. But if you play it where it's supposed to be played, which is at the seventh position, it's got this thickness to it and it flows way better. You get this. Isn't that a lot better? I mean, it doesn't only sound better, it's so much easier to play. Cause you just have to go like this. So if I had a Malcolm in my band, I could do a lot less. I could just be like. <laughs> well, he does all the bouncy notes, but if you're by yourself, you kind of have to merge the two parts together. I teach you how to do that on my website. I did a whole breakdown of this song, so check it out there if you want to. The next detail I'm going to talk about is a little bit subjective because even the actual band ACDC speeds the song up live just to give it that live energy. But what I see a lot of bar bands do is they speed it up a little too much and it makes it harder to dance to. <laughs> When you're playing in a bar and you have a dance floor, you want to give it as close to the original tempo as possible because just the way that song was constructed, it's so perfect for a dance tempo. Sped up, ACDC Live, it's great, it's a concert. People are watching it, they're in awe, they're seeing the actual band, it's cool. So I don't think they're as concerned about people dancing at a concert. But if you're at a bar and that's the whole point of your band being there, I would say keep the tempo pulled back a little bit. Not too slow though, that could be bad too. A lot of people roll their eyes when I bring up how important the kick drum pattern can be for certain songs, but this one in particular, it's crucial. There's a band I found on YouTube and their drummer started off with the incorrect beat. Luckily he figured it out and he switched to this beat. Isn't that so much better when he changed over? A big part of that is because when you're playing just a straight beat, kick, snare, kick, snare, that's great for a lot of tunes, 
but this song needs to have that delayed second kick. It has to have that hole. You almost feel like you're gonna fall into it and then it catches you. I don't know why, but I call that a slag beat. I don't even know if that's a real word, but it just feels like it's slagging along when you do that. And it gives it a certain feel, like I said, that's really uh, conducive to dancing. Something I see a lot are drummers that hit way too many crashes at the first part of this tune. There's really supposed to be no crashes until Brian Johnson says mind is aching. Take a listen to the song and you'll see there are no crash symbols until that part. So I've seen a few drummers online that are crashing all the time and it just adds too much noise in the beginning. <laughs> I sound like an old man here, but uh, you got to leave space in order for the parts that do come in with a crash to be more effective. That works really well. I hate to say this next part because a lot of bands have really good intentions when they want to play this tune, but I think this song is just a little too high for a lot of vocalists out there. You know, I see a lot of female vocalists hitting it really well, but sometimes there's a male vocalist that's struggling through the whole tune and I feel really bad because it's a really tough song to keep singing all the way through when you're at the very top of your range the whole time. So I would recommend tuning down if you can for this tune. Uh, I've heard bands transpose it and it goes okay. It's just one of those tunes that if you stray too far from the original concept that uh, it kind of loses its power. But if you could do it in standard or down a half step, that's great. But if you're struggling through that whole tune, I mean, it might not even be worth playing this song for your band. Something that I see a lot of singers do, which is genius, is just have the audience sing the chorus because it'll give you a little bit of a break and you can compose yourself for the next verse. But if you have a rhythm guitar player, make sure they come in at the right time. I'm gonna do a quick trivia question for you. So not counting the intro, when the drums come in, when does Malcolm actually start playing? Is it right away with Angus? <laughs> That part, does he come in when Brian Johnson starts singing? Or does he come in when the bass guitar comes in right before the chorus? Sorry, that was a trick question. It's actually none of those. He comes in halfway through the first verse. That blew my mind when I really realized that because if you listen to it with two speakers or headphones, you'll hear his guitar come in halfway through the verse. Very strange. <laughs> I honestly would have guessed he came in right when the first crash symbol hits, when uh, Brian Johnson says mind was aching, but that's not where he comes in. This might be hard to believe, but I've seen guitar players play the verse with power chords instead of the open position chords. So I've seen people go like this. Actually, that's probably how I played it in my metal band. Keep in mind, you have to do that ACDC power chord, which is actually very uh, close to the full G chord. Sounds huge. Then you do a traditional C chord, pretty much. And Angus does this cool little jump with his ring finger. Instead of uh, moving back to this position for the G, if you watch him, he goes from here to here. And then he goes to the D. Then he goes to like the middle finger for the G. It's an interesting way to do it. It's very economical. Let's talk about the drums for a second. I already kind of did, but uh, let's elaborate on it. When the chorus comes, I've seen some drummers go to the ride cymbal. So don't go to the ride. There's no ride in this song. So it's kind of nice. You could just stay on the hi-hat the entire time. <laughs> Gotta switch to the bass really quick. So I've seen a lot of bass players come in right away when the drums come in and uh, they just start doing the main riff. but there's actually no bass in the entire first verse until Brian says mind was aching when the crash comes in. So it's kind of a big moment in the song. That's when you're just supposed to start hitting the D. It's a really great way to build up into the first chorus. When it comes to the second verse of the song though, there is bass guitar. It does something a little bit strange, which is really cool. It goes like this. Like always, I put a little bit of edge on the bass tone today, so it really comes through on small speakers, but I usually wouldn't use that much gain on it. I love that jump up to the octave G like that, but the very last time, I think it's the third time in the verse, he adds the F sharp really quick. He goes. Just a fun little detail to throw in there. Another problem I see with a lot of bass players that play this tune is they try to overplay because it sounds like it's such a groovy song that you should really be doing it up. For example, the chorus, they tend to go like this. Then 
That'll work, but it's a little too busy. If you listen to the isolated bass track, you actually only hear this. So you don't have to constantly ride eighth notes during that part. You could back off a little bit and let, uh, I don't know, let the drummer do the work. Another cool thing is that the bass is really hitting those push hits like this. So those up hits, but Phil Rudd's back there just laying down that downbeat kick drum. So it's cool how they work together. You don't always have to hit the bass guitar every time the kick drum hits. It would sound like this if you tried to. It's just not the same. You gotta allow the kick drum to do those downbeats sometimes on its own. Let's talk about the solo. I hear a lot of guitar players do the solo justice because it's one of those things you don't wanna mess around too much on. I have heard people just go off and try to create their own solo and it usually doesn't land right. <laughs> You can watch my video about how I used to do that all the time. I used to just try to shred over the top of these classic solos and how big of a difference it was when I finally just sat and learned some actual licks from the song. This one you're going to want to do pretty much the way it is. And why wouldn't you want to? There's some sweet little... <laughs> When I finally put in the time to learn that solo a little closer to the original, I learned so much from it. There are like 50 little things in there that I've stolen over the years from my own stuff. So I highly recommend trying to learn it as close as possible, at least once. The rhythm guitarist and the bass have to follow the kick pattern during the solo. It's so important. When a band doesn't do this, it loses its power. I say that a lot, but it's true. <laughs> Listen behind the solo and you could hear them doing something like this. It kind of goes unnoticed a little bit because all of our attention goes to Angus, obviously. But if you listen to the background, you could tell that they're in sync with each other and really holding it down. Earlier, I talked about how some drummers I saw hit way too many crashes during the verses when there's really none until almost the chorus. But when it comes down to it, there are a lot of crashes during the solo. And sometimes it goes unnoticed as well, just because the whole band is rocking. And it's hard to tell that Phil Rudd's actually hitting every other beat with a crash. As soon as the band gets done doing those syncopated hits together, all of a sudden it opens up. And when that happens, Phil starts to crash every other time. Take a listen to it and you'll see. It's another dynamic choice that really builds the song up into the final chorus. And I think that gets overlooked a lot with a lot of cover bands, like I say all the time, including the ones that I'm in, that these things are important because they're actually moving you to different sections of the song correctly. Otherwise, it could seem like a straight line, like a flat line, kind of like your band is flatlined on this song. You don't want that. The last thing I'll talk about is sort of an overarching concept. And that is if you try to play ACDC without the right attitude or the right mindset, it doesn't come off correctly. For example, if I played the solo straight and I was just worried about sounding good, it would sound like this. It's got no feel to it. What I like to do whenever I play a song like this is I like to have the correct attitude. I play with that attitude and I feel it. I try to embody it. That sounds weird, I know. But when you're playing a band like ACDC, you sort of have to insert some of that energy into it. So when you do that, when you take from maybe a deeper place in, inside yourself, you get more like this. <laughs> See, it just feels more alive. I think that's because I'm putting the right energy, the right attitude into that solo. Think about what the song is singing about as well. That could put you in the right mindset. Sometimes that can be dangerous with ACDC, but you get the idea. It makes me laugh because I remember one time an original band that I was in was playing a show and the band after us threw in a couple covers. And one of them was, you can't always get what you want. And I was standing next to my drummer and he looked pissed. He had his arms crossed and he was like this. And I'm like, what's wrong, dude? He's like, well, 
this part of the song is really serious, you know, and they're up there jamming like they're having the best time of their life. And, you know, I was like, dude, you know, pull the stick out of your butt, have some fun. Who cares? You know, but his point was that they weren't embodying the attitude of the song. You have to admit, though, the way the song feels, it does lend itself to get kind of jammy. You know, I guess I could compare Hey Joe. It's kind of the same idea where if you listen to the lyrics, it's pretty serious. But uh, they're up there smiling. You know, if you watch like G3, sometimes they're all just going off and soloing over the top of that. But if you really take in the lyrics to that song, I can see why it would seem strange. Okay, everyone, I had a ton of fun doing the research for this song. And uh, if your band wants to implement some of these details, let me know how it goes in the comments section. I'd love to hear from you and we'll catch you at the next video. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye.